Okay, everyone, we're going to get started here today. Uh, today, we've got a very, uh, very cool topic. We're analyzing one of our races uh, that we've, we've done a race analysis on in the past, uh, this time from the Rio 2016 Olympics, uh, where we're going to be analyzing the women's 200 meter freestyle. Uh, and specifically, we're going to be looking at what was Katie Ledecky's edge uh, throughout that race. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty epic showdown, if there ever there is one. So this is a, a great race for us to be analyzing today. So a little bit of background about myself. Uh, my name is Tristan Meharry, uh, co-founder and CEO of Tritonware. Um, I uh, also was the former captain of the University of Waterloo swim team. Uh, and at the same time, I'm a mechatronics engineer by background. So you know, I get to really combine my passion of uh, engineering and technology, uh, as well as my passion for swimming uh, to, to help uh, you know, try to solve some problems that we're seeing in, in the swimming world to, to further the sport as best we can. In terms of, uh, you know, some quick housekeeping items, um, you know, for, for those of you that have attended previous sessions, uh, the next uh, slide might be a bit repetitive because we are going through some similar stuff just to get a quick overview of the platform. Um, but uh, please stay tuned. We're going to get through it pretty quick. Um, if you do have any questions throughout the sessions, definitely we do want to hear them. Um, but please do, uh, uh, do save all those questions for the end of the session. Uh, we will have a Q&A session at the very end uh, where you can enter your questions uh, through the Q&A section uh, in the webinar here. Um, also, uh, if you do have any technical difficulties throughout the meeting, uh, just send us a message uh, or if you can't get back on, don't worry. We will be sending out a video recording of this event uh, so you will be able to see it after the fact uh, as well as the presentation that we're running through. Okay, so then uh, what we're doing in terms of today's schedule, we're going to be quickly going through a quick overview of Triton Wear, then we're going to dive right into our race overview and a lap-by-lap -lap race analysis uh, of what we saw in Rio for the 200 freestyle for women. Uh, then we'll get into some conclusions from that race and then some takeaways you guys can use in your training every day. All right, so quickly to start with the Tritonware platform. Uh, the Tritonware platform starts with the Triton unit hooks on the swimmer's goggle straps to capture their performance metrics based on their motion through the water. Uh, so we're capturing splits, stroke count, stroke rate, turn time, time underwater, uh, breath count, and, and much more that you can see here listed. Uh, and we're doing so at four times the accuracy of the next best competitor. So you have data you can trust and rely on in practice. Throughout practice, that data is sent in real time to a coach's tablet for every athlete in the pool simultaneously. So we're really op automating that entire process of data collection for you guys as coaches. Uh, as you can see on the screen here, that's what your tablet would look like uh, with tiles for each of your athletes and data coming in throughout the entire session uh, with no work required by you guys. Once the workout's over, that data is logged to each athlete's profile to provide you with long-term tracking and analytics as never before, really making test set reporting extremely simple and streamlined so you can streamline rather so you can see not only if your athletes are improving, but more importantly, how they're improving. We also have tools to show you how to learn from the pros where you can analyze against top tier athletes to see really what goes into those amazing swims. Okay, now to dive into today's topic. The women's 200 meter freestyle. This was an epic, epic race uh, at the Rio Olympics, uh, headlined by some of the some of the top uh, female athletes out there. Um, this was actually a really interesting time in history for the women's 200 meter freestyle, specifically because you know two of the top swimmers in the world, Katie Ledecky and Sarah Schoestrom, uh, you know, ultimately they're effectively swinging an off event for them, uh, even though they are constantly flirting with the world record line. So this really just goes to show you how extraordinary Katie Ledecky and Sarah Schoestrom are as athletes. Um, but also that did not really rule out the rest of the field as this was a packed field full of veterans, including the current world record holder, uh, Feder Federica Pellegrini, um, who holds the record of 152.98. Uh, granted, this was during the full body suit days. So here's some quick background on these athletes leading up to the event uh, as a refresher. You know, Katie Ledecky, obviously from the US, uh, you know, the master of distance events, uh, extremely versatile across all distances from 400, 800, and 1500. Uh, but the 200 freestyle really would be her toughest test there in Rio. Um, however, she has proven herself this in this event before, and she did win the gold events, the gold in this event uh, in the 2015 World Championships leading up to the Games. Uh, and you know, knowing her for her strong distance ability, we do know that you know Katie can't close like a freight train at the end of this race. So we expected to see that. Uh, Sarah uh, out of Sweden, uh, you know, unmatched sprinter and butterfly in 2013 uh, when she claimed her world championships title. You know, she's been uh, virtually undefeated since then. Uh, she's also proven herself multiple times in this event, uh, even though she did scratch the 200 free at the world championships in 2015. Uh, she actually did end up beating Katie Ledecky's gold winning time at the same event by leading off that four by two relay. Um, but however, as a sprinter, we do expect Sarah to go out much faster uh, and just see if she can really hold on to that speed. 
Federica Pellegrini you know, has a decorated history in this event, including a silver in Athens, uh, as well as uh, a gold in Beijing. Uh, and then she did smash the world record uh, in 2009 at the World Championships during the, the suit era. Uh, Pellegrini did miss the podium in London, so she was looking to get a bit of redemption. Uh, and she did have a strong swim at the 2015 World Championships, where she was just behind the decky to take silver in the event. Um, and ultimately, Emma uh, McKeon, you know, in this stack field, she might seem like the underdog, but she is also, uh, you know, at the time, she was, I think, the fourth swimmer to break the 155 barrier that year uh, and had a very, you know, set of impressive swims at trials. Uh, she also comes from a strong family of swimmers, including uh, father and brother who were at the Olympics and mother and uncle who did compete at the Commonwealth Games. So leading up to this, there were some predictions for this race. Uh, people were predicting that Katie would win the event um, and followed behind by Sarah Showstrom. Uh, and then third, people were predicting that Federica Pellegrini would take the bronze. So to dive into the race itself, looking at this data, just to keep in mind when we're looking at stroke rates, keep in mind that these are in seconds per stroke. Uh, you know, so basically that's from the right hand to their other right hand hitting the wall. Um, and distance per stroke are shown in meters per stroke. So single arm distance per stroke. Uh, this is just how the analysis does done here. But your actual application, when you use the technology, you can choose whichever units you like, whether it's DPS and stroke cycle or stroke rate in cycles per minute. So quickly looking at the data here. So you're seeing the lap winner was Emma. We saw she had an extremely strong start and we saw her with the fastest speed, which you can see here in the data as well. You can see here that uh, Federica had a very early breakout uh, in this uh, in this event, uh, right off the dive, and she's really just playing catch up the rest of the length. Although she does have a very high stroke rate, uh, in this case, stroke rate the lower number means a faster stroke rate. Um, we saw Sarah had uh, you know one of the strongest starts here and a very strong, powerful stroke, uh, taking in some very fast early speed as we would have expected. Katie, we did see uh, you know she does have actually the least efficient stroke in terms of a stroke index standpoint with the highest stroke rate. Uh, so this, you know, it can be effective, but it can also be very, very hard for athletes to maintain over the course of a longer race. So now, so now digging into the second lap by the numbers. So again, Katie and Federica, if you look at the stroke rate line here, you see they have by far the fastest stroke rates out of these groups. You see they're actually maintaining uh, high stroke rates uh, while you know Sarah and Emma are actually maintaining you know, relatively low stroke rates. There's almost two separate races going on here right now. Um, however, Federica, she did slow a bit relatively uh, and the combination with a shorter underwater, she lost ground from the leaders on this length. Um, but Sarah and Emma increased their stroke stroke count for this lap, uh, and uh, but they were really just unable to maintain the same DPS as they increased, which really cost them time at the end, allowing Katie to really catch up uh, from some of that deficit from the first lap. Uh, what you can see here is at the end of this lap, while Emma was behind slightly, uh, or sorry, rather was still slightly ahead of Katie, uh, Katie was really close on her heels. Uh, she was only six one hundredths of a second behind, if you're checking out on the time there, uh, which is a very dangerous place for such a strong closer uh, to be coming at her. So when we're looking at, uh, at Katie, the way she swam this, she maintained that strong stroke rate. She maintained her pace at the same time, uh, and she had solid turn, quite fast, uh, and strong underwater, which you can see here as well in the data. In terms of Federica, we saw that she did lose time in her turn and her short underwater once again. So we saw the slowest turn, uh, and we did see the shortest underwater as well, uh, which can be, can be a bit of a challenge as they have to export more energy throughout the rest of the length. And we did see a bit of her stroke rate falling off as well, which uh, not necessarily a good sign uh, this early in the race. Uh, Katie, throughout this, you know, she was maintaining her, her rates and her, her uh, you know, her speed in this race. Um, but what's really interesting to see is that she only increased her lap time by 1.4 seconds off of her first 50 compared to everyone else who increased their second 50 by over two seconds from the rest of the field. So that's where she really gained, uh, gained her time. Uh, you know, Sarah, she had a pretty sharp contrast between her stroke rate rising and speed declining uh, comparatively. Uh, and really what we're seeing uh, is uh, Federica might have a bit of trouble later on in this race based on what we're seeing. So now digging into the third lap uh, by the numbers. So what we saw here was that Katie was really the only one to hold her stroke count. So what we're seeing here, she maintained 42 strokes again, same as the last length. Um, you know, however, her speed and her stroke rate rose ever so slightly throughout this. So, however, she was really, you know, 
she was able to reestablish her first lap distance per stroke, which was great because it gave her the edge she needed to pull ahead at this leg of the race. And her endurance is clearly providing her with the ability to maintain, you know, that stroke rate as well as strong turns and still maintaining good long underwaters. Um, but she's uh, she's clearly clearly getting ahead. So ultimately, Federica, uh, you know, at this point, she's uh, still holding that high stroke rate. Um, but what we're seeing is she's continuing to increase her stroke count significantly while decreasing her efficiency. Uh, so she's kind of, you know, losing a bit here because she's expending a lot more information, which is, or sorry, a lot more energy rather, uh, which is really suggesting she's getting tired uh, and it could be tough on that final leg of the race coming up. Uh, her walls are still just really hurting her at this point. You know, what we can see in the data, her turn time is still very slow comparatively, and her underwater time is still quite low, uh, which is uh, is not helping throughout this race. Sarah on her third lap was very interesting. Uh, she actually was able to hold her stroke count and speed while slightly ramping up her stroke rate. So, you know, she's still managing to be the most efficient stroke in the field, uh, as you can see through her stroke index here, where the higher number is better. Uh, but it does look like she's really ramping up her stroke rate for that third leg to really crescendo into that final leg. Uh, in terms of Emma, we see that uh, she's showing a little bit of weakness at this point of the race as she did start out so aggressively. Uh, she really increased her stroke count similar to Sarah. However, she's really unable to hold her speed uh, as what you can see through this data here uh, while speeding up her stroke rate slightly, uh, which uh, shows she's uh, likely slipping a little bit through the water. Uh, so Emma does need to work to maintain that stroke rate in DPS in the latter half of this race uh, to win against these fierce competitors in this field. So now when we dive into the final stretch by the numbers, this quickly turned into two separate races between Ledecky and Schulstrom and McKeon and Pellegrini. What we saw with Katie is that her endurance really was shining through. Uh, you know, she she finished strong with you know a stable change in all of her metrics throughout. Uh, her strong underwaters kept her ahead, um, and combined with her high stroke rate, this was an extremely powerful combination. You know, we saw the deck. really put her head down there in the last ten meters or so and drive to the wall to narrowly take the win by just over three tenths of a second uh, with a you know after a valiant effort by Schulstrom in that final leg, uh, as we see in the numbers here as well. Uh, Sarah, we see that she did break out uh, in second and uh, was really pushing to run down the deck in that last leg. And it looks like she's actually been gaining ground uh, you know, with her strong, powerful stroke. Uh, and she did this as well as increasing her stroke rate and maintaining speed while the, actually the rest of the field slowed down. So we can see, uh, you know, Sarah actually came home faster uh, and, and was able to, uh, to pick it up and gain a bit of ground, but just not quite enough. Uh, so surprisingly, you know, Sarah really did outpace Katie on that final leg, which we really didn't see coming. Uh, she beat her out by five one hundredths of a second, um, as you can see in the numbers up in the split time section up at the top there. However, it really just wasn't enough to recover from the deficit from the second and third laps. But if Schulstrom had made her move a little bit earlier, we might have actually had a different gold medalist, or if the pool had been slightly longer, uh, as is the case at many times in these events. When we look now at the, the battle for third and fourth between Emma and Pellegrini, uh, Emma really just didn't have the energy uh, to increase her rate to keep pace with these leaders and started to fall behind while Pellegrini really did storm home. You know, we saw Pellegrini you know, have a very, very strong finish, really utilizing her veteran skills in this event, uh, gaining strong ground on the less experienced McKeon. And uh, you know, she almost was able to, uh, to out-touch uh, McKeon in this. And really, if her walls had been a little bit stronger, uh, even in this last lap, she very likely could have come third in this race and we could have had a different bronze medalist uh, at the Rio Olympics. So now diving into the final here. Uh, so we did have Katie come in here at the gold in a 153.73. Sarah at the silver at 154.08. Emma McKeon bronze at 154.92 and Federica Pellegrini fourth at 155.18. Ultimately, Katie was able to hold on to her lead after that uh, after that third leg and beat out Sarah by 35 uh, one hundredths of a second, uh, and ultimately, you know, narrowly missed the fastest textile time ever of 153.61 held by Allison Schmidt from London 2012. Emma ultimately really did surprise everyone, uh, you know, coming in 84 uh, hundredths after Sarah and narrowly beating out Federica Pellegrini uh, by 26 uh, one hundredths of a second. Ultimately, the total difference between first and fourth being about 1.4 seconds or so. Uh, this is a, a tight race and, and two, two epic showdowns almost in the same race. So I really can't wait to see what this race brings next week at World Championships in this epic, epic event. So as we noticed earlier in the race, uh, one of the very cool things that we can see through the numbers and through the data is that ultimately, you know, we saw 
two very different strategies coming out, but it's interesting to see that it's happening in these kind of groups. So what we see uh, in the green and purple lines on the left uh, and the right is a strategy by Katie and Federica, uh, respectively. And you can see that they are pushing for a higher stroke rate strategy uh, where they're going to be increasing their stroke count over the course of length uh, and really pushing to maintain that tempo throughout the entire race, uh, which you can see through the numbers that uh, Katie was able to do uh, much more effectively to maintain that high stroke rate uh, based on her endurance skills. Then you can see in the orange and yellow lines, uh, a strategy driven by Sarah and Emma, focusing on what's typically referred to as a more efficient race strategy, uh, focusing on a higher distance per stroke, stronger stroke, uh, and uh, and a bit of a higher uh, or you know, relatively slower stroke rates comparatively. Um, so ultimately, you know, both of these strategies clearly are very effective as we see, you know, first and fourth having the same strategy and the second and third having the same strategy. So this really just goes to show you that, you know, there's not one right answer or perfect formula for all of your athletes. It really does depend on the athlete and their individual strengths and weaknesses. This is why it's so critical to track your athletes so that you can give them more personalized feedback during training to really get them to reach their full potential. Because this just goes to show that, uh, you know, there's different ways to skin the cat as it were. So in conclusion, when we look at Katie, obviously her strengths are, you know, it's her endurance, her ability to maintain high stroke rate for a long period of time without losing efficiency significantly. Uh, the weakness here is really it is a bit of a higher energy output. So in future, you know, what she could try to be doing obviously is trying to increase her stroke length without losing rate to increase that overall efficiency. When we look at Sarah, she's clearly very strong on her front end speed while also driving home very well. Uh, but ultimately, one of the weaknesses that we saw here is that she just didn't ramp it up soon enough and that it was a bit variable throughout the race um, as far as that can be. Uh, in terms of future training, you know, we would say it would be a bit more efficient to level that out uh, in terms of her pacing throughout this race uh, to make it more consistent and not fall behind and have to catch up again later on in the race. With Federica, we saw her strength. That uh, sprint and that final length was uh, extremely powerful where she almost overcame Ella. Uh, so ultimately, uh, you know, we also saw that her weaknesses were her turns in her underwaters, which really, you know, if she had improved those a little bit, could have made the difference between uh, having a medal and not having a medal. Uh, so ultimately, in terms of future notes, you know, improving those walls to save energy, you know, she could have had fewer strokes, uh, you know, a little bit less you know, input required from her arms uh, if she'd improved those walls, uh, which could have made and paid dividends uh, by the end of this race. Emma, uh, very strong, turns in underwaters, consistently holding good underwaters in this race. Um, her weakness, uh, a bit of her endurance past 100 meters as she did go out extremely aggressively in this race. Uh, in terms of focusing uh, on areas of focus, you know, we'd say maintaining her speed while stabilizing that TPS and stroke count uh, over the course of the entire event. So that's great. I mean, it's always great to see what the pros are doing, but you know, how do you guys take away this information so that you can use it in your sessions? So we've, uh, you know, we've outlined a few different things here that you can take away now uh, as coaches and athletes. So, you know, some things around, you know, how are your mid-distance swimmers really maintaining, uh, you know, after the 100 meter mark uh, and in a 200 meter race? You know, so this question is very important. You know, what can you do to help them improve the back half endurance of their races and what's going into that to make that happen? Or are they saving up too much and, and being able to come home a little bit too fast uh, and not going out hard enough? So having those numbers really help you there. So another question, how are you, or sorry, how are your swimmers underwaters and their turn times affecting their total race? As we saw with Pellegrini, uh, you know, it can have a, a large impact over the course of a 200 meter race uh, and even more so in longer distance races. So can you make up uh, you know, a bit of difference by improving those skill sets? And can you improve on maybe weaknesses you might have in your stroke by having killer walls? Um, that's another piece you can be learning here. Another question, how stable is the change in metrics over the course of the length uh, and like the length uh, throughout the entire race. So, you know, how can you increase the stability of your strategy? You know, with Sarah, we saw a bit of fluctuation compared to with Katie. Uh, and ultimately it makes you, you know, you can start off in the lead and then you gotta be coming back and trying to catch up by the end of the race. So how do you increase the stability of that race strategy? Again, now what is the weakest point in the race that you're analyzing? So we can now pinpoint exactly what the weaknesses are for each individual athlete. So now how can you help them overcome uh, to ultimately, you know, change that time at the end of the race or that speed at the end of the race? And can you really pull from any of your other sports performance playbooks to help them improve? You know, now that we can see what Katie did or what Sarah did, how can we help other athletes do that as well? 
you can also help them pull the strongest attribute of the race that you're analyzing to help celebrate those strengths and those victories and then use that as learnings for all of your other athletes and again as i mentioned before you know different athletes have different strengths so you've really got to play to them it's important that you track your athletes or you really just won't be able to find that ideal strategy that suits them specifically. Uh, so that's uh, you know, a key component to what some of our learnings here, different strategies for different athletes, and you can uh, really get to the same time with different approaches to the same race. All right, that was basically a quick skim through that race analysis, uh, pretty detailed in terms of the numbers, um, some quick learnings from it. Uh, but uh, you know, I'd like to thank you for coming out today uh, and, uh, and, and reviewing this race with us. Um, please do subscribe to our webinar series uh, and keep an eye out for our video series that is coming out uh, later on this summer and definitely uh, got all of our social channels here. So please do follow us there to stay tuned for all the new news that's coming out. Uh, and uh, if you've got our email program, uh, please be subscribed and then do subscribe if you're not. And that'll make you, uh, you know, get all the information from these various uh, webinars and other events that we run. All right, and now we'll be getting into the final piece of the day, which is our question and answer session. So now the floor is open. Uh, if you do have any questions about this analysis or even about the, uh, the product in general or really absolutely anything. So just let us know if you have anything you'd like to uh, ask us uh, and we'll keep the floor open for a, a few minutes here. So if you don't know where that is, it's in the tab at the top, you'll see a Q and A section where you can type in some questions uh, and we'll answer them uh, as they come in. So we'll give you a few minutes here. All right, please uh, yeah, do answer or put any questions in if you do have any, um, unless I did such a good job explaining this that nobody has questions, <laughs> but I doubt that's the case. So please do uh, put any questions you guys might have. All right, so we do have a question here. Um, could you please explain stroke index? For sure. So stroke index is a measure of an athlete's efficiency. So what we do in terms of that calculation is it's your distance per stroke times your speed. So it's effectively how far you're traveling with each stroke and how fast that stroke is taking you. So really what we're trying to show you there is the overall efficiency of your athletes. Uh, we find this is a great metric uh, for, for coaches to start with with their athletes because basically you know, the higher the number, the better. And it's a very easy thing for, uh, for coaches to get their athletes to start tracking from day one uh, as they start to add more and more data to their training regime. Uh, so, uh, yeah, great question there. So we do have another question here. Uh, what would you recommend us to do for, uh, for you know, doing this kind of race analysis for our athletes? Um, currently, I'm only collecting data from practices right now. So this is a great question. Um, you know, ultimately the, the way that we're doing this is we're providing data as well in our platform. Uh, so, you know, we're trying to analyze more and more data uh, for, for our customers so that you'll have access to this data to compare against your athletes. Uh, so, you know, the way we say it is it is good to benchmark against, you know, the top in the world for sure. But again, it's also very, very valuable to benchmark against, uh, you know, the people at the exact same level as your athletes. So um, I, think it's, I think it's valuable at times to be analyzing you know, races for your individual athletes. I don't think you have to do it all the time, uh, but it's a good way to get, uh, you know, a benchmark of how your athletes are doing in competition versus practice, because some athletes do have a little bit different uh, of an approach in competition than they do uh, in, their, in their practice, unfortunately. Um, so I would say it, it definitely can be valuable. Uh, and it can also give you some information to benchmark against uh, or even just to use in practice uh, to compare against the data uh, the data that you're gathering we do have another uh, a little bit more a little bit more of a comment i think but it's uh comment is it's a bit surprising that katie ledecky would have such a high stroke rate given that she is a distance swimmer uh, not, a, not a sprinter or uh, or to a freestyle by, by background uh, and we would agree uh, it's it's very interesting uh, and you can see that from you know, the very first 50 she was out like a bullet with her stroke rate uh, she was out in full force uh, and this was likely uh, a strategy piece for her. You know, she knows she's comparing against uh, you know epic sprinters like Sarah Schoelstrom, who is going to go out fast and guaranteed to go out fast. And if Katie has any hope in, in taking it back and, and winning the race by the end, she has to go out fast too. Uh, so I think it must have been a strategy that we saw uh, with her really trying to just wrap up a rate and maintain a rate. And because she has such strong endurance, uh, there was a high likelihood that she could maintain a much faster rate uh, than other athletes in the field. So another question here, uh, will you be doing any race analysis from yard races for us from, uh, from the USA uh, to compare during our short course season? 
<clears throat> so currently we're doing uh, race analysis. Uh, it's a little bit ad hoc to a degree. Uh, we did analyze, however, we analyzed NCAA championships last year. Um, so we have actually every single final from NCAA championships analyzed. Uh, and that is basically something that we have on our roadmap to put into the platform for you to benchmark you know, really what it took to get you know, into an NCAA final uh, last year, not just from a time perspective, but from a stroke rate perspective, from a time underwater perspective, you know, from a, from a stroke count perspective. Um, so all that information will be there as well. Um, you know, if there are specific races, people are looking to get analyzed uh, from specific competitions, um, sectionals, things like that. You know, we are always open to, uh, you know, to, to getting feedback from, from our customers and, and, and doing that kind of uh, race analysis. So uh, please do let us know if there's anything specific that you guys are looking for. All right. Any other questions before we wrap this up for the day? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep the floor open for maybe about 30 seconds more. So if you have anything else at all, just let us know. Uh, if, uh, if anything comes up after the fact, after you review the, uh, you know, the, the presentation again, you know, again, do feel free to reach out. You know, we're happy to answer any questions you guys have. Uh, you can email us at info at uh, or reach out to us via uh, any social platforms or what have you. Uh, and we will uh, do our best to get back to you as quickly as possible. Um, but uh, again, I'll keep the floor open for you know, about 20 to 30 seconds more. All right, everyone. So I think we'll, uh, we'll call it a day with that. Uh, I, again, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, I hope it was helpful for you guys. I hope you learned a lot. Um, you know, we're going to be keeping on uh, you know, with this trajectory of adding in a new webinar uh, on, a, on a weekly basis or so. Uh, so if there are, anything, uh, are any topics that you would like us to cover or even other races you'd like us to analyze, uh, please do let us know. Uh, you can email us at info at uh, for that or for any other questions you might have. Uh, so again, do tune in uh, on the next webinars as we come out with them, uh, and we will talk to you guys soon. Thank you.